Hello, everyone. This is Mary Keurig with Frontrunners Innovate, and I have a group of wonderful gentlemen who are just ready to rock and roll this morning. Everybody, I think everybody's East Coast, the United States, and we've all had our coffee. <laughs> you know, we're all uh, up and going, or at least Eastern time zone anyway. Uh, we have with us a very special guest who is actually a candidate for U.S. Congress of 20, 2023 right, and uh, for District 2 of Ro Rhode Island, and uh, he's a candidate for that. We also know that he's a founder of an NGO or a uh, nonprofit organization that is involved with refugees from Gambia and uh, called the Dream Center. We also know he's an author. We're going to hear about all of this and his background as a journalist and some of the other things that he's involved in, trauma and recovery from trauma, uh, sorts of uh, counseling and, and types of things that would be involved with treatment of trauma. So we're going to hear about all of that, but let me introduce my co-host today. This is Richard Sweat, former U.S. congressman and also former ambassador to Denmark from the United States, and uh, is, is an architect by profession, but uh, is connected to me through Climate Prosperity Enterprise Solutions. So I call him a front runner, as well as his partner, Michael Rowan, who works with him, who is a political consultant and researcher. And uh, just but between the two of them, there isn't anything they can't do. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that right now. So I've invited them because of the political background, but also because of the impact orientation of the work that they do. And also the same with uh, Omar. And the, another connecting point is the interest in Africa. Um, all gentlemen share that, so as well as so do I. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to start with the questions, Omar. Um, let's get you rolling. Tell us a little bit about your background from Africa, where you were born, and bring us up to date really quick. Well, well thank, thank you so much, Mary, and thank you, Michael and Richard. Uh, it's an honor to be here, um, to, to be faced with uh, three amazing people, and um, I'm here to learn. But... Um, I'm, I'm here as a political candidate uh, for Rhode Island Congress uh, uh, District 2, but more because of my background, that is what brought me here. That's what made me a candidate. You know, I grew up in a small village in Gambia, um, which is, uh, you guys have experience in, in Africa and other parts of the world. When we say rural in those countries, it means the poorest parts uh, of those uh, societies and no access to clean water, no access to actually water. Uh, my mother was the only wife in a, a fa an extended family of over 30 people, meaning because of the culture, she did all the domestic work, the cooking, working for miles to carry pots of water on her head, uh, being tortured, uh, domestic violence. Uh, I grew up watching her and became her protector as a little child. You know, instead of growing up as a child, I was a protector for a mother, a young mother who was married very young in her early teens. And that spoiled my interest for human rights. I mean, my, my village did not have a school. I had to walk for miles to go to school, often without, without shoes, without uh, barefooted. I mean, you know, the sun in Africa, and that's why we need to invest in solar energy because the sun is very hot, I mean, scorching. And, um, a kid would walk like me would walk for miles to school uh, to, to get to a school, to the nearest school because I needed education because my motivation was I wanted to be educated. I wanted to, to be able to help my mother to protect her. And I wanted to be a lawyer at some point. I wanted to, uh, to be a human rights lawyer to fight and protect women who are struggling like my mother. It, she became the whole inspiration around my life. And uh, I wanted to protect girls who couldn't go to school in my village you could count the number of girls who would even attend school because they are forced into marriages. And, or, and when they end up getting married, there's extreme level of, levels of domestic violence and, and labor that is unacceptable in, in modern day. So I wanted to protect this, kind, this category of people. And then it, it then spawned into wanting to protect everybody because then there was a coup in the Gambia and the Gambia being the, the smallest country on the, on the, on the continental Africa. Um, it was usually overlooked. People did not know about it in the world. So there was this dictator, I mean, a military dictator who overthrew the civilian government and terrorized the entire population, you know, stole properties and money and destroyed everything. So I wanted, oh, now I have a better reason to be a lawyer, to, to, to fight people, fight for human rights, protect women and 
Eventually that journey did not continue because I did not have the money to continue my legal education. And I did two years in community college and pre-law and that was the end of that journey. Then I walk into a, a small newspaper office one morning. I said to the editor, look, I go to the courts. I'm a law student and I, I think I can be reporting a lot from the courts because my, my whole hope was I need to find a new way of being a lawyer. I mean, the purpose was to uplift people, to, to, to fight for people. I thought to myself, through journalism, probably I could, I could have a voice. I could be, give a voice to others. I could empower people. It may be similar. I'm just switching the tool that I'm using for this. And the, the guy, the editor was fascinated, a young man around 20 years old will walk into his office. I want to be a journalist under a dictatorship that many people were running away from. So he encouraged me, he said, go, go do it. I mean, he was hysterical. He started laughing. He said, you really, this is what you want to do? But you are too young. And then I was motivated. I started reporting mostly from the courts. That's what I knew about. And then um, the, it, it was even more interesting because there were a lot of politically motivated cases that I was reporting about. And um, because of those court reporting, I was arrested and seriously tortured in 2001 when I was um, reporting a secret trial of a coup, uh, a military group that were accused of attempting to overthrow the dictator. And that became a norm in the Gambia then. Almost every two, three months, you'll hear a coup attempt. Soldiers will be killed and tortured and detained. In, and it was just the norm. So I attempted to cover one of the secret trials. What they would do is sometimes when there's outcry by Amnesty International and all the human rights agencies across the world, they will pretend to do a trial but the trial will not be uh, uh, justified because they will just, it's just kangaroo trials and uh, they would not want <laughs> journalists to, 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 try to, to cover that because then it will expose the anomaly. I attempted to cover it. I went to the court martial at the, at the military barracks and the, 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 the government was not happy about my attempt. They arrested me and seriously tortured me and put me in, in a small cell that was and not actually designed as a cell. It was a closet where they, 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 they stored their pickaxes and shovels for whatever construction they were doing. Yeah. I couldn't even stretch my legs. And it was in the summer, very hot. And uh, it was a closet. I, it was literally a closet. And that's what they used as a makeshift cell. And uh, luckily for me, I, I was there for a day. That it was in public when they, where they, it happened. And, a lot of outcry, Amnesty International, uh, Reporters Without Borders, all the international human rights agencies you know, uh, made a lot of fuss about it and I was released from, uh, luckily, because most of the time when you are arrested in that setting and the public does not see you, you may end up going missing. A, a friend of mine has been missing for 17 years now. So that was the, the, the journey I encountered as a as a journalist in the Gambia, and eventually it became a norm. I was um, either arrested or tortured or released or threatened, and I, I just continued doing my work until 2006, when um, uh, the killings uh, were more, human rights, uh, 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 human rights violations were increased, and journalists were afraid to publish. You know, even editors would not publish anything that would be critical of the dictatorship because they would be arrested or killed. And um, I started reporting for a US-based uh, website that was free. Of course, they were based in, the, in America and they called, we were called Freedom Newspaper. And uh, they reported a lot about the Gambia. So I became uh, their correspondent from the Gambia and it was an opportunity for me to write on, on control, on censor. And the, the dictator's intelligence agency uh, hacked into that website mm -hmm. and they wanted to find, find out who was writing for them from the Gambia. And it was very critical because finding out who it was meant if they caught the person, the person would be dead. And they found out I was still in the Gambia and they declared me a wanted person. My pictures were all over the internet. And uh, to cut a long story short, I was able to escape. Um, my escape journey was very uh, abrupt because I was uh, I embarked on this, on this journey to leave Gambia. If you know Gambian geography, it is just a river. It actually, that is the that is the country. The country is named after the River Gambia, mm -hmm. and then uh, it, so there are small strips of land on either side of the of the river. That is the country. It's inside Senegal, so uh, you must cross some sort of a boat or a, or a ferry before you get getting to the other side of the country and then to Senegal. And um, 
I was caught at a bridge actually. And the soldier who was searching the bus I was in is somebody who was a schoolmate 10 years earlier. That is the only way I was I'm alive today. Wow. He did not say anything. He just recognized me and asked the boss to leave. He was literally shaking himself. I was already giving up. I stood up in the bus and raised my hands up because I thought it, it was just too much. I, I wanted to, literally, I wanted to die. I, was, I couldn't handle it anymore. So I said, well, whoever is searching this, we just gone with a torchlight asking for IDs. There were hundreds of soldiers crisscrossing the bridge running after vehicles, searching every car that came to the bridge. So I thought to myself, this is it. I stood up, raised my hands. And this guy, when he recognized me, he was literally shaking. And I opened my eyes. I realized that he was um, a schoolmate 10 years earlier. He did not say anything. But with his reaction, I knew he, had, he wanted to help me to escape. Yeah. He asked the bus driver to move. That's how we got across the bridge. And uh, I ended up eventually getting to Senegal. And then my pictures were blasted across the media on, on TV for three days by the dictator declaring me a wanted person. Well, I mean, I was very scared and traumatized, but reflecting about it today, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it because I, I, in my pictures were not on TV for being a criminal or for robbing a bank, but for writing about the dictatorship or being a journalist. So that, that uh, calms me down a little bit thinking about it today. I ended up in Ghana and then the American embassy connected with me. They were very concerned about my safety. And um, uh, you know how refugees end up in camps for 10 years, 15 years, some forever, never going back to their countries of origin or never going to a third country and just staying there. For me, I stayed only one year in a refugee camp. Uh, in, in Ghana, and uh, actually it was not even in the cause in the traditional camp, it was in the in a slum area in the capital, Kokom Lemle. And uh, the embassy started expediting, Omar, we need to get you out of here, we'll take you to America. One thing that I still say to my children who were born in this country is, you know, we have 54 countries in Africa. And I'm a Muslim, there are probably over 50 Muslim countries across the world. None of these countries gave me home and the chance to a second life. The US gave me that. So my children, I tell them, I, you are not born here only by design. It is, this is your home. And this is my home too. I have nowhere to go. That is why actually my biggest, one of the number one issues I'm running on as a congressional candidate is to defend the democracy because um, I came to value it more than ever after growing up under authoritarian rule and now living for 15 years under de democracy. I know that democracy is a better option and uh, I will fight to defend it because without here, without this democracy, without this country, I'm probably going to live on planet Mars, right? Uh, <laughs> this is all I have. <laughs> so, and uh, I mean, it's actually even more critical now seeing what, is, what Putin is doing, uh, threatening democracy and a former president is praising him as smart and savvy. It is, uh, the, the, we, it is uh, much better. Actually, this is a better time to even stand up to, to, to bullies and uh, to threats against democracy. And I think we have to recognize how critical uh, these times are. Uh, this is how I ended up in the US. That's perfect. Uh, one, yeah, one year that later. I, a story. <laughs> so you came to the United States in 2009? No, 2007, actually. 2007, um, okay. Yeah, I, I fled the Gambia 2006, and one year in Ghana, the embassy brought me to, to America in 2007, May. Um, actually, this is the funny part. I remember one day before arrival, I, I, was, I was talking to the American embassy to receive my document, my uh, approval documentation from the State Department, a letter. And then um, the embassy were so happy. They said, actually, they had driver to, to an office. I think it's called OP to pick up my letter. It was there. Everybody was so excited to me. Oh, my, you're going to be safe now. You're out. <laughs> and then um, a day before my travel, there's this agency called IOM, International Organization for Migration. They do the travel for refugees when they're traveling. And then um, I went to their office to take all this barrage of medicine for malaria, I think for yeah. worms and malaria. <laughs> they do that for everybody traveling to the US because they, they didn't want to get sick before doctors figuring out. I was so dizzy, I couldn't even open my eyes properly. And <laughs> I asked this case manager, I'm going to America, really, I'm going to America. I couldn't, honestly, it was like you talk. I was like in another world. I couldn't believe me, America, no after all that happened to me. Then he said, yeah, you're going to America. Actually, you're going to Providence. 
Providence. And, and when did you when did you obtain your citizenship? In 2012, I got my uh -huh. citizenship. So five right in the five year, five, five year to the day, I'm sure. Five years later, a day before my arrival, I did not know Rhode Island. Actually, I thought it's an island. And five years later, I became an American <laughs> citizen. And that's been 10 years now. So <laughs> 10 years as a citizen. That's fantastic. Well, well, you remind me, you remind me of my father-in-law, who is uh, the only Holocaust survivor to serve in Congress, but he was Hungarian by birth. And yeah. he used to always say that he was American by choice because he came to the, to America to to realize the freedom that he didn't have in a communist country. Mm -hmm. And uh, your story sounds very similar. You're an American by choice. Um, Michael and I, our families, my family's been here since the pilgrims. I don't know, Michael's probably same time, but but we we were born Americans and, and here we are, uh, not complaining, but uh, <laughs> you are an American by choice. That's a, <laughs> a great story. Yeah. I'm gonna, actually, this is a good segue about your platform and what you want to talk about. I'm sure you want to get a little bit of that out. So I'm going to let the, the gentlemen here who know more about the political end of things and and Congress to be able to pull that out of you uh, for the next few minutes. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to end up uh, the conversation talking to you about the Dream Center. So gentlemen, take it away. <laughs> Dick or Michael. I would ask the question, how did you get from the providential um, moment where you entered the United States in, in Providence um, to the place where 10 years later, you're a candidate for the United States Congress? Good question. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, so yeah, so I've been here for 15 years. It's going to be 15 in May and uh, about 10 years after I became a citizen. But I think um, uh, two reasons. One, um, I think uh, I am honored to be an American citizen, to be safe here, to be free here, to to have my children grow up here and to attend the American dream. Uh, American dream includes be, being a citizen, getting the safety and getting all the opportunities that I would never have had even if I were in my own home country. Uh, I look at my upbringing and I look at my children's upbringing here uh, as an American by choice and my children being born here uh, it contrasts a lot that the American dream is a reality. Uh, but it's a combination of hard work and grit and determination and uh, I went through all that within 15 years, I was able to get all the education I needed, bachelor's degree, two master's degrees and a doctorate, and uh, found a center that helps thousands of refugees, not only from uh, Africa, but across the world. Currently, we're working with Af Afghans and um, owning homes and helping, mentoring other people and building bridges between Americans and, and immigrants and refugees. I thought that lived experience the, 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 the freshness of understanding of issues, of equitable economic issues, environmental issues, issues of, of, that are needed to build jobs that are well-paying for a living wage for people to live normal lives. I think that is, um, that is one of the reasons why I'm doing this because I believe it is important to have a voice from the outside of the political realm. It is, it is important to bring in experience, but I think there's no better experience than people who live the experiences, whose, experience, whose freshness of knowledge and know-how is fresh and is necessary for uh, taking this country forward, but also to, to bring in diversity of representation in, in Congress. And I think the second thing is uh, about uh, hand ups. Uh, folks often forget about the difference between handouts and hand ups. Uh, I was an early proponent of uh, the Arai Promise, which is making community college free. And you see uh, thousands of young people now attending community college, getting better jobs, sustainable jobs, young mothers getting education that they would have otherwise had. And then um, eventually, I think the idea that folks can think of starting from here and then getting there just because of the resources that they receive, I think that is my my advocacy here. My point in becoming in joining this political realm is to is to promote the idea that let's tone down a little bit about this idea of handouts. Handouts would be people receiving food stamps and refusing refusing to get out of them, or receiving public housing and refusing to get out of it. All the people I know and the the, the Americans that I see every day. They want to receive resources and then get attend the American dream and then 
get out of the receiving handouts and those are handouts and that's what i want to promote the uh, fight for and build and promote legislation about providing hand hand ups which is resources like education public quality public education health care health, health access prescription support uh, protecting the environment and uh, housing defending social security because my mother is is here and is without social security she wouldn't have been able to take care of herself and those are the kinds of things that i want uh, people to understand americans are very resilient people and with little resources they get there and i'm a clear example coming here within 15 years getting my education starting a center just out of courage and not knowing where i would get the money from and then i got all the support and and the resources to help thousands of people through my own lived experience and that is the kind of uh, uh, know-how i want to bring to congress and my life as a, a community organizer i've seen the importance of building bridges and uh, with my lived experience i think i can do that i have an a, a an almost 80 year old so called, um, Holocaust survivor who was a refugee. He came here when he was three years old, three to five years old. He, he actually has memories of what happened in Austria and other uh, in their journey escaping the Holocaust. He, he is the volunteer, the lead volunteer who's teaching uh, refugees at my center to be American citizens. He's teaching the citizens <laughs> class. And one of his students who just became a citizen is Mohammed from Syria, also in his 70s, and their big best friends. Imagine a Jewish refugee from Austria and uh, a Muslim refugee from Syria. They came over 50 years apart, or actually over almost 70 years <laughs> apart. And then they are here in this America with the hope and opportunities and freedom and democracy working together. I think that's the best example of uh, building bridges and building a better world. Omar, and, uh, let let me let me address uh, what you're talking about right now. <clears throat> when I served in Congress, which was probably before you were born, um, I could see this this uh, polarization starting even back in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very troubling to me because what I saw were Democrats who were who were talking to different groups. And any time that you talk about different groups, you're pointing out differences between people. And that really is not a motivation to work together that really is a motivation to work against each other because everyone is is clamoring for their their piece of dirt in the public square mm -hmm. um the other thing that that i saw was that we were we were ignoring um entire groups altogether and and these were the the middle class uh, americans who who lived in the in the center of the country who who had not really been a part of the the discussion um, exactly. in the political world mm -hmm. and so my question to you is how mm -hmm. are you building those bridges and what are you going to do to to keep this country from continuing to fall uh, apart and to be polarized in the extremes because that's i think going to be the the critical message that you've got to get out and uh, you've got people you've got to get people to understand is so important. So I'm, I'm no, curious. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, thanks Richard. I think um, my two, three top issues are equitable economic development, defending democracy, and also the environment. Because I think um, equitable economic development cuts across uh, different social and economic classes. Um, uh, you know, if we get the rich, the extremely rich and corporations pay their fair share, it will help the build back better America and then uh, invest on individuals to uh, keep their uh, living, to promote uh, success, uh, which is the middle class, but also to support the working class to, to get to that level uh, attaining the American dream. I think uh, just helping uh, defend uh, social security, for instance, uh, will just get people to live normal lives and rather than struggling in a country that has so much to offer. The same thing with helping basic things like uh, the child tax credit uh, to help a, a single mother to pay uh, child care so that she can do two jobs to take care of her family. I think um, with defending democracy, I think, uh, as I stated earlier on, um, uh, my world and life of building bridges between different communities, people that often would not talk, that would promote uh, polarization, as we've seen in Washington, I think my experience of building bringing different communities together is what i hope to achieve rather than uh, promoting that polarization based on partisan issues um 
uh, I build, bring together people from different ethnic communities, different religions together to communicate, to interact. And uh, during the George Floyd era, I think uh, my contribution was uh, really a clear example of why it is important to bring different communities together, the black community and the police. Uh, there was so much division and animosity. And what I did was I went to the training academy, uh, the police training academy in Providence and the statewide police training academy. And I went there as a speaker and, and I became a trainer on, on diversity and cultural competency. And I walked in, <laughs> I walked into the room, uh, like 40 recruits and they stood up and good morning, sir. I said, no, 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 you're scaring me. <laughs> I'm scared of police. <laughs> then they started laughing. I said, the fact that we are here laughing, a young black male, I'm afraid to drive at night. My wife would not even let me drive at night because he thinks a police officer will shoot me a black male driving at night. That's how traumatized she is. But I'm here laughing with you. This suit has to be in my car all the time. When I'm driving it, I have to put it on, at least to give a different impression to the police, not to misjudge me. Mm -hmm. And I said, but I'm here, we're talking. And <clears throat> ask me what you need to know about people in my community, or people who look like me, so that we can understand each other, build bridges. Then they start asking. They tell me, oh, I'm scared of black men because I think they, they sell drugs. Oh, I think they're going to kill me. They're going to fight. And we have this conversation. I bring them to my office at the Refugee Dream Center. They meet young people who otherwise could have easily joined gangs. Mm -hmm. There is so much hatred and, uh, and, and fear of police. And the police also have this fear and distance with the community. I bring them together. Hundreds of them work together. And I said to myself, I can do this in Congress. I mean, I, I'm not gonna be naive about the polarization and the difference in political ideologies, but there must be at some point as a nation, we come together. We've seen now with the crisis in Ukraine, there is no way as a nation, except for Trump, who is praising Putin as a, a savvy and smart. But I think the majority of Americans will come together on issues like this to understand that the polarization does not help them to come back as a nation of one and work together. And I really want to achieve, achieve that. Despite my progressive ideals, I think um, um, the issues of social justice and democracy and equitable economic development and the environment is big for me because as a refugee, I know if we don't invest in protecting the planet, it will affect our economic uh, statuses right now because the gas prices will go up, food prices will go up because of the increase in, in global oil prices and the supply chain will be affected. That is at home level, but the weather patterns changing will affect everybody, not only in the coastal areas. And talking about immigration, that needs to be reformed. We will, the, group, the industrialized world will see a phenomenal uh, migration that we've never seen before in, in, in history. There'll be droughts, there'll be flooding all across the world, there'll be terrorism, there'll be uh, civil strifes and fall of, the, of, of regimes, uh, for example, of what happened in Afghanistan and what is happening in Northern Nigeria. And we will see this because if folks cannot cultivate their lands or if they are flooding, they'll be displaced or they'll not be walking, they'll not be going to school, they'll not have any economic activity to do. And people will be displaced by billions of, or millions or billions of people. And mm -hmm. we will now know why it is important to, to deal with the 10 million people we have in immigration rather than dealing with billions. And I think just investing on our planet will, will take care of that, but also take care of the economic challenges we go through here right now. I mean, I going to the stop and shop will tell you <laughs> that the prices have doubled or almost doubled now. And uh, you'll take that back to issues of uh, uh, climate change because uh, the, the supply chain is affected, the chain is affected and uh, uh, people's forces are, are hurting. Uh, my issue is really the lived experience. And I, I want to attain uh, that lived experience for everybody. I started from here. I was, I couldn't, I couldn't even buy, buy food for my family when my wife joined me two years after arrival. I own a home. I got education. I founded a center. I, I mean, I can say, I'm probably at middle class now. So I have the experience of the working class and the middle class and what it takes and why this country can offer that for everybody and mm -hmm. why we should fight for everyone to get to that level. I have one last question before I think Mary wants to ask you about your, your um, NGO. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to know what led you to decide to run for Congress in the party that you chose to run in? 
Well, to, th thank you, uh, Richard. Um, one, um, I think I needed to have a voice. I, it was important to, I, I'm the kind that must speak. Everything about me is voice from the childhood uh, memories of wanting to protect my mother to have a voice and empower women like her to have a voice to being a journalist to have a voice empower others to have a voice but also to speak about issues that matters matter to me to now with the work i am doing so i thought to myself jim langevin uh, who was who's the congressman who's vacating his seat after 22 years had me for almost four years in his diversity committee in, because he wanted me to my voice to matter he wanted me to tell him about issues that matter about people wanting upward movement in the economic uh, certainty of their lives and, and issues of community, issues of ethnicity, everything that he thought I could offer him. And it was great conversations whenever we met in this committee. And uh, now that it's gone, I see why can't I offer my voice at a more apparent level? And then that is where I said to myself, I'm not sitting down and watch the establishment politicians decide for me or the same people coming. I mean, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, it is about not the person who walks on Broad Street on, on the south side of, or, or in, the, in the rural parts of, of, the, of the district once or twice a month, uh, once or twice a year, but the person who walks it every day sees the challenges of middle class and working class Americans and leaves them and has the know-how and can take that know-how to Congress. So it's about a, about voice rather than being decided for having the uh, the audacity and courage and using that freedom of democracy that is offered to me to say, look, I will have a voice and I'm not letting to be decided for or to be to be told. I'm I'm doing it because that's what this country offers. Imagine I can never try that in Gambia. And um, actually, I recently had coffee with one of my opponents. He reached out to me, oh, I like your resume, let's have coffee. I said, oh, let's do it. I met him at a coffee place in the district. I said, you know, number one, I have respect for you, but I have more respect for the democracy that this country offers us. In the Gambia, opponents will be killing each other. And here, they are having coffee. That alone for me is success for this election. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the reason why I'm running on the democratic ticket is because I mean, you know, uh, as a refugee or an immigrant, number one, entering at JFK, when I landed my foot at JFK in 2007, number one word that came to my mind was belonging. Oh, I belong. This is home. I have a place that I now call home and I'm free and safe. And uh, I wanted to associate with anything that gave me that sense of belonging, sense of well-being, sense of identity. And uh, I saw that in the Democratic Party, I saw that um, it is the party that gave me the, the ideals of welcoming. Of course, you, it, in every setting, even within my own family, <clears throat> we don't agree on everything. <laughs> and I think that is the ideal of democracy anyway. But um, in the Democratic Party, I'm not saying we agree on everything, but it gives me the, the thought of sense of belonging, <clears throat> sense of acceptance. <clears throat> it is not a place where somebody like me would be insulted or vilified or made the order but i am made to feel that this is home we identify with you we you you belong here and that is number one reason why i'm a democrat i mean with all the other issues are secondary for me and that is um, uh, why i'm there i mean of course i may be uh, progressive because of my issues of social justice and immigration and equitable economic development and somebody may be moderate or extremely right demo democrat but we all belong and i feel welcomed and i feel uh, that sense of identity with the democratic party thank you well stated what a great conversation this could go on for another hour and we just have all kinds of good exchanges that would dovetail into some really interesting opportunities i think so another conversation coming omar but uh, let's end up this with if you will share a little bit about the the refugee center that you started the the dream center and when it was founded what you're doing there just a little bit about that in the last five minutes and let's end up with you sharing with us what types of people do you need to meet to kind of move your progress forward? We know you need voters. <laughs> we know that already. <laughs> so, let's, anything else, uh, you know, and then we'll uh, we'll end up uh, just mentioning your book. And so uh, we'll provide all the links. So everybody, if you 
you know, aware now that he's an author, of course, The Ordeal of the African Journalist mm -hmm. uh, is a book that he's written. So we'll provide links to all of that and how you can connect with him on, on LinkedIn and any other websites. Uh, at the end of this um, this interview, we'll have it in the details. So Omar, talk to us about the Dream Center and then lead us into who you need to help you. Move yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, I, I started the Dream Center in 2015, about seven years ago. And uh, the idea was to help people integrate and be self-sufficient, uh, people meaning refugees and immigrants and asylum seekers and, and regular Americans who need help. Some people may just be out of housing or became homeless and need somebody just to help them with the resources or the application to get out of that situation. But majority of them are refugees who are coming to this country new. So the way the US uh, refugee program works, and by the way, it's all humanitarian. <clears throat> it's all based out of the goodwill of the American government to go out there in the camps or, or across the world and say, well, there are 70 million refugees or 80 million refugees displaced in camps and internally displaced across the world. But America will take about 80,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, other countries do like Canada and uh, uh, across the world. But America is the country that takes more refugees than any country in the world mm -hmm. as a way of support. Even Republican administrations, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> so. And they bring, actually Bush, I think it was one of the biggest uh, uh, people admitting refugees and then Obama. But, um, but the idea is, is all humanitarian. They bring in refugees and give, distribute them to different cities across the, the country. And then uh, believe it, even in, in Utah and uh, Montana and South Dakota, imagine they, they go, in, <laughs> I tease my friends in, in, in Idaho, you know, I need potatoes. Um, so they, literally there are refugees in almost every city across the country. And uh, the idea is to be self-sufficient, get into the city, integrate into American society and be part like any American and contribute to, to this country uh, economically. So, but the, the support lasts between three to six months. Okay. And you know the federal government supports uh, volats, which is local agencies, and then to to help them to help these refugees when they arrive. But it's a very short time. So after going through the, the struggle, after three weeks, I got a job at the bank, and then I was out of the door. But I was able to get around. I mean, I could read and write English. I could type very fast, so I could able I could get around. But I saw I met a lot of mothers from Iraq, from uh, Liberia, from Rwanda, and uh, a lot of people families, most of them cannot even read and write in their languages. And I, I started volunteering. That was my only family, the refugee community, because I did not know anybody, no family or friend. And I said to myself, no, there must be something that could be done. What can we do to ensure that there's no abrupt support after six months so that there's continuation of services? And that is really what inspired the Refugee Dream Center. Why not we start a center? where refugees with lived experience can help fellow refugees who are recently arrived, not to stay in, in, in a situation where they're depending on the welfare system or they're stuck for years. Why not get them out of the welfare system? Why not help them to be self-sufficient? So we started the center, we do English language classes where they continue to learn English so that instead of six months, you are stuck, you continue to learn English. Maybe one year later, you are now getting at least the functional English to be able to work and get them into jobs, mentor young people. It's, it's very easy for young people coming to this country, especially in the South side, to get into gangs or be thrown and not go, into, go to school. So basically the idea was mentor young people, help them reach resources, uh, learn English, get people to jobs, just be self-sufficient so that there's no abrupt a stop in the support. And that is what we do. We work with refugees from all over the world. Currently, there are about 2,600 individuals that we work with. About three to 400 or 500 of those are recently arrived from Afghanistan, from the evacuation. And I think more will be coming from Afghanistan because they're already in the different military bases in the US yeah. here. Yeah. So that's, those are the population we are working with. So everybody from across the world, you know, people from different ethnicities, different cultures working together. And then even the staff of the center is people from different ethnicities, the board the same way, because we want to make sure everybody's catered for. There are almost 20 languages spoken at the center because people who, yeah. have, who speak two, three languages <laughs> are working there. So the idea is really just using our lived experiences of people who've been here before working to help recently arrive to get through the, 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 the process of integrating proper into American society. Fabulous. Fantastic.
<laughs> wow, that's that's a big uh, that's a big chore, big uh, a big thing to do, and we applaud you for that because I, I think it definitely is needed. You know, I've I've learned about teachers in different places who uh, run what we call welcome centers, which are refugee children coming oh. assimilating into schools. Um, I think Bill Gates uh, interviewed one one time that became the teacher of the year. So I, that was the first time I knew about such things. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so end us up. Tell us who you need to meet to, to move you forward with any of the efforts that you've got going on. Well, it would be I'm, I'm honored to meet Michael and Richard because I, I love the off the cuff conversation we had before you started recording, by the way. <laughs> uh, as a newbie, a political, a political newbie, it was so you need them. Is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> it's, it's good to hear people who have experience in the politics, but also who that authentic um advice and lived experience. Because mm -hmm. I'm not a politician, I'm a community person. I'm I'm a, I'm a psychologist also by training. Yeah. I, mean, I work on trauma and healing and uh, mm -hmm. uh, building communities, and, and that is the lived experience, the authentic self that I want to take in in this oh. into this politics. But there may be strategies that are needed <laughs> and, <laughs> and avenues that are that needed need to be used. I need everybody. Please come and help me. I need. I need <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. We're going to end this up saying thank you to everybody. Stay on with me, guys. I'm going to invite everybody else, but. Um, this is Omar Ba, and he is a candidate again for U.S. Congress uh, out of Rhode Island, District 2, um, for the election in 2023. So if you have questions for him, and I know you do, uh, you can contact him through LinkedIn. We'll provide that. We don't give out phone numbers and email addresses here, so uh, you can do that. I want to thank uh, Michael Rowan and uh, Ambassador Dick Sweat for joining me as co-host today. And this is going to be an ongoing conversation between all of us. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody by saying, if you're thank watching you. this on, yeah, if you're watching this on YouTube, go to www.frontrunnersinnovate.com where you'll see this interview, all the information that Omar is providing us about how to connect with him and the Dream Center. And uh, we're going to say goodbye. Adios. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Happy front running, everybody. Uh -huh. Go ahead, well.